Good afternoon. Today is March 10th, 2022. Welcome to the bill hearings of the Ways and Means Committee. Our first bill is Howard County Delegation Bill 1306 that will be presented by our delegation chair, Delegate Courtney Watson. You're on mute. Courtney, you're Sorry about that. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am here to present House Bill 1306 for the Howard County Public Schools, which is alternate instruction model policy. Uh, thank you for having me here today. You have been provided a letter of support from the delegation. Uh, the bill is at the request of the Board of Education of Howard County, who since 2019 has presented a legislative initiative to the delegation seeking the authority to think outside the box when it comes to offering a continuum of learning. This idea, sometimes called reimagining time, is ripe for consideration in the ever-changing educational landscape, especially given the impact that the COVID-19 has had on providing instruction inside a brick and mortar classroom. HB 1306 amends Education Article 7-103 to allow Howard County to use alternative non-classroom-based instruction to count towards the 180-day requirement. Alternative instruction models are defined under the bill as synchronous or asynchronous instruction delivered outside of a school classroom through the learning experiences that do not provide in-person instruction. The board may adopt a policy on using this method for school closures due to various emergency situations such as hazardous weather, disease epidemics, physical constraints such as damage to school buildings or utilities, a civil disaster, disaster or law enforcement emergency. The policy must include alternative comparable instruction for students or staff who do not have internet access. The policy calls for limitation on the use of this model for individual schools to the shortest time period possible until in-person instruction can be resumed. Finally, the board can adopt the policy if it negotiates, the, it can only adopt the policy. This is important. The board can only adopt the policy if it negotiates the terms of the implementation and use of the model policy with the exclusive bargaining units of the Howard County Public School System. Ultimately, the bill gives flexibility to the Howard County Public School System to provide a quality educational experience to students in Howard County when in-seat in instruction is not possible. I request a favorable report on HB 1306 on behalf of the Howard County delegation. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Are there any questions for Delegate Watson? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 1306. Thank you. Thank you. Next, House Bill 1258, Delegate Kipke, and we have members of the Appropriations Committee joining us. I'm not sure if they're here yet. Delegate Novotny, I see, and Delegate Solomon and Forbes are supposed to be in here as well. Um, so whenever you're ready, Delegate Kipke. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you, members of committee. Uh, I know that this committee uh, does a lot of work around the area of education, uh, but as a fellow delegate, I thought I'd put my thoughts forward as as to some certain as to towards some things that I believe uh, we could. Uh, expand upon in the area of education in Maryland. Uh, this bill does three things. One, it codifies uh, the options and opportunities for students today, which we uh, refer to as boost and increases the funding for it going forward. Uh, it establishes a uh, authorization organization for public charter schools, uh, codifies uh, financial support and asks different aspects of state government to provide additional assistance, such as DGS, providing unused and vacant buildings as options for public charter schools. And lastly, it provides a tax credit for families who are homeschooling. Uh, so as we all know, there's a dramatic surge in the number of students homeschooling throughout the state. Uh, some of uh, those families um, are making great sacrifices to do what they believe is best for their children, and this would provide some additional financial relief. Uh, from what we've seen over the last few years, we know that people are seeking different and, and more flexible methods to educate their children for whatever reasons. Uh, and I believe that we should be doing all that we can to offer educational uh, options 
that parents uh, believe best suits their children. And for those reasons, I ask you to consider uh, this legislation and these thoughts as you deliberate on education bills going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for Delegate Kipke? Okay, seeing none, thank you. That concludes the testimony on House Bill 1258. Next, Delegate Rose, House Bill 1280, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, committee members. Um, for the record, Delegate April Rose from District 5 in Carroll County. Um, you've seen this bill before. I think this might be year number four. We've passed it out of this committee. It has passed through the House and uh, usually seems to find problems over in the lovely Senate across the street. This is a simple bill. Um, this, again, um, enables, it enables, does not require, but enables county boards of education to allow a computer science or computer programming class to satisfy the graduation requirement for one of the math credits. Um, this would allow them to do it. It does not mandate changes in curriculum. Um, basically, um, I've updated and I've shared with you before, code.org is a great uh, clearinghouse for the latest stats, and this is a growing trend. Um, according to code.org, as of a few days ago, there are currently more than 627,763 open computing jobs nationwide. This is an increase of 227,763 positions just since my testimony on this issue last year. We have heard consistently in this committee that there are between, on average, 15 to 20,000 open computing jobs just in the state of Maryland. These are all high paying jobs, well over double the ad average annual salary of other positions. Re research has shown that women who try computer science in high school are 10 times more likely to choose this as a major. Black and Latino students are seven times more likely. This trend just continues to grow in the United States. Last year, I testified that 40 out of 50 states allow a computer science or programming class to count towards a math or science graduation requirement. That number has now increased to 48 out of 50 states. It's time for Maryland to join this list. It's important to take this step because it places value on these classes as our children are choosing uh, what classes to take in their high school years, they have to, you have to have value on graduation requirements because they are obviously first and foremost in getting these things accomplished in order to graduate with what is needed. Um, I have sent along um, links that will uh, show you those trends. It's on code.org. You can look at each state some states allow actually science or math. Um, it has been testified over the years, and that's why I changed it to just math, that there was um, value placed on doing this in the math arena and not necessarily in the science arena. Um, in addition, uh, as we have been discussing the blueprint bill over the years, it's going to take a while. In fact, I'm sure we all read uh, the recent story that um, it looks like there's going to be a delay in some of the inflammation implementation of the blueprint bill. We cannot wait for that. We need to do something right now while these plans are being developed so that no child loses this important opportunity to have access and the, op and the opportunity to choose this as one of their graduation requirements. Um, we live in a technology-driven society. We certainly saw that over all, the, all of these months and months of our kids uh, working remotely, parents working remotely. No matter what, career path a child decides to take, uh, technology skills are highly valued and will be very well used in many arenas. I've worked as a technical recruiter for over 12 years. The hardest positions to fill are those in the computer science and especially the computer programming arena. Average starting salaries just for a basic help de desk technician is between 60 and $65,000 per year. As these careers progress, which is actually very quickly, there, the salaries will go well over six figures, especially in the defense sector. And actually in recent years, the commercial sector has grown even beyond the defense sector. So I thank you for your time and consideration. I hope that I will get a favorable report once again from this wonderful committee. And I thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them. Are there any questions for Delegate Rose? 
Okay, seeing none, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 1280. Thank you, Delegate Rose. Delegate Ivy, House Bill 1305. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, for the record, uh, Delegate Julian Ivey here presenting House Bill 1305. Uh, this is another piece of legislation uh, that deals with our Montessori schools here in the state of Maryland. Uh, this legislation specifically establishes uh, eligibility requirements for Montessori schools and programs under the pre-kindergarten expansion grant. Um, we know the pre-K expansion grant uh, established in 2018 as part of the Education Commission on Innovation and Excellence in Education. Uh, the purpose is to expand access to public pre-K uh, for three-year-olds and four-year-olds with priority given to students from families with household uh, incomes up to 300% of federal poverty guidelines and students with special education needs regardless of their income. Um, presenting this legislation uh, with an amendment that would further clarify uh, the student to staff ratio and classroom size, uh, as well as authorizing the Board of Education to consult with specialty program teachers, including Montessori teachers, and determining how to implement the pre-K, uh, the kindergarten readiness assessment. Uh, some specific parts of the amendment uh, are as follow, uh, adds the current definition of a Montessori school to the bill. Uh, it also amends House Bill 467, uh, which was heard by this committee last month uh, that lays out teacher certification process uh, for Montessori teachers, um, uh, amending that into this legislation um, and bringing them both in line with the other. Uh, the amendment also brings um, this legislation in line with current practices for Montessori programs, which allow for students to be grouped together from ages two and a half to six uh, removes the square foot requirements for a classroom that was put in the initial uh, draft of the legislation. Uh, so I've been working with our, our subcommittee chair on this issue, and I, I really look forward to continuing that work, and I ask for a favorable report on House Bill 1305. Thank you. Are there any questions for Delegate Ivey? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 1305. Thank you, Delegate Ivey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Next, calling House Bill 1356, Delegate Grammer. Good, eve uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair. Can you hear me okay? All right, fantastic. Thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee. For the record, Delegate Robin Grammer here to present House Bill 1356. I'd like to start with a story. A few years ago, we were joined by two young ladies from District 6 who served as pages in Annapolis. The girl from Dundalk was a student board of education member for Baltimore County and attended Patapsco High School. The girl from Essex attended Chesapeake High School. They spent time meeting their lawmakers, including myself. And as they were politically inclined, they asked what I was working on and I asked for their thoughts on policy, which naturally led to their experiences in the public school system. They shared many stories, but the one that stood out was a story from the student who attended Chesapeake. She said that she was sexually assaulted. She said a male student had groped her, attempted to kiss her, and pressed himself on her. She said that not only was the school administration unmotivated to deal with the issue, they seemed to just want the issue to go away. When I asked her how this was resolved, she told me, my boyfriend beat him up. Since that story, I've been similar to, sensitive to similar reports from students and parents and the problem has only grown. The more significant problem, I believe, is that in many cases, in these infractions, uh, the parent of the student isn't notified of the issue, issue at all. The issue culminated in my district with a student walk out of Patapsco High School, uh, where students uh, protested lack of action um, by sexual infractions by student peers. A letter submitted to this committee by the Maryland Coalition Against Sexual Assault outlines the magnitude of the problem. As of August 30th, 2019, 56.4% of schools, elementary, secondary, and post-secondary under investigation by the Office of Civil Rights for the Title IX, Title IX sexual harassment violations are K-12 schools. Additionally, 32.5% of schools, elementary, secondary, and post-secondary under investigation by the Office of Civil Rights for Title IX sexual violence violations are K-12 schools. Sexual harassment and sexual violence violations persist in K-12 context, in part because the procedures and policies currently implemented in schools are failing students. In the case of harassment, sexual misconduct, or stalking, House Bill 1356 
requires school administrations to file an administrative incident report with the county board that includes details of the incident, requires a copy be provided to the student parent, requires the local board to adopt necessary policies to implement the bill and report to the General Assembly. These infractions were selected based on the nature of the sexual infractions described to me by students and parents. Ensuring that students and parents have an accurate account of the most egregious personal, personal infractions and reporting the related numbers to the relevant board and to us in the General Assembly is a good start for dealing with these problems. Also, I will note, Madam Chair, that the uh, Maryland Coalition Against Sexual Assault has requested an amendment um, that allows the um, case to be escalated to parents through an inter in intermediary in certain sensitive situations. Uh, I have drafted that amendment. I'm fine with that, and I will submit it to the committee for consideration. With that, I'd be happy to take questions, and I'd ask for a favorable, favorable report on House Bill 1356. Okay, thank you, Delegate Ebersol. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I'm reading the bill, uh, and uh, you know, really, I'm glad you're concerned about this issue. It does say if if, if an incident of sexual misconduct, uh, rate right stalking, harassment is reported to school administration, does this refer to events that occurred on school grounds, or is this is this if somebody tells the administration that something like this happened uh, last night, you know, when they were hanging out together? Uh, uh, this this would uh, occur exclusively on school grounds. That those are the only issues um, we we were interested in. Probably needs to be clarified in the language a little there. Okay. Um, and if we we heard a bill a little while ago about reportable offenses. So if someone if if something like this were to happen off campus and the police uh, report this to the administration, are they then required to fill out a form then also because it's been reported to them uh, for an incident also that occurred off school grounds? If it were reported to the administration by law enforcement off grounds? Yeah, let's say let's say a student has been arrested for sexual misconduct. Uh, right now we have a we have a statute that allows that or may require that to be reported to administration. So the bill doesn't touch that. And I, I wanted to stay away from infractions outside of school grounds. I attempted to limit it to school grounds. And I also wanted to stay away from anything that required specific actions in regard to the infraction. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to, the only thing we really wanted to accomplish with this particular bill was to provide a standardized system for creating incident reports so that um, students who will allege to be victims and parents of those students just have an account. So this doesn't require it to be put in the student's record, doesn't require it to be escalated. You're, you're going beyond my question there a little, uh, and I thank you very much, but I think you need to clarify that part that it does. it, it refers to only things that happened uh, on school property. Okay, I'll work on that, thank you. Questions, Delegate Guyton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Delegate Grammer, also, I appreciate the fact that you're really concerned about this. I am as well. I wondered if you looked into what the current procedure is for these things being reported through the school system, because what you're, what you're, um, what you're suggesting happened in this particular case, it sounds like it was more of a problem with compliance and enforcement of the current regulations. Um, have you looked into what's already in place? So I've inquired about this and what I've been told by the Board of Education is that the rule is that these issues are not documented uh, or acted on unless there is a repeat offender. But the problem with that rule is that a person cannot be a repeat offender if you're not recording the initial escalation, escalating situations. So if you have a, a, the, first, the first example of a problem becomes a he said, she said kind of thing. And there, there really is no specific protocol for just ensuring that if there is a claim, at least it goes on paper. Um, Madam Chair, yes. so I, thank you. Just to follow up, I would like to look into that a little bit more because I do believe that the, the offenses that you described are offenses that are actually uh, disciplinary issues for the school. So does not sound like an accurate response to me. So 
Um, I would look into it a little bit more and uh, and see if that's uh, if it's a compliance issue or if the law needs to be changed. Uh, understood. If that is the case, none of the schools are complying, but I'll, I'll take a peek at that. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Delegate Grammer? Okay, seeing none, thank you, Delegate Grammer. Thank you. That concludes the testimony on House Bill 1356, House Bill 1276, Delegate Attar. Thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Vice Chair and members. Um, for the record, I'm Delegate Attar testifying on behalf of House Bill 1276. Many young people in Baltimore City are receiving government services from multiple government agencies and nonprofits, and all of these organizations collect data to better improve its services. These organizations cannot currently share the data that they collect. This lack of information sharing prevents Baltimore City from equitably meeting the needs of its young people. So the goal of this bill is for these agencies to be able to share data and tailor interventions and services appropriately. This bill establishes the Baltimore City Youth Data Hub for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, security, and well being of youth and to improve equitable access to programs serving youth in the city. The hub would consist of Baltimore City Government, Baltimore Promise, and Baltimore City Schools, and they would share data to improve youth programs and services across the city. The bill will also establish an executive committee and a manager of the hub, as well as procedures to safeguard the security and confidentiality of the data. I filed this bill at the request of Mayor Brandon Scott, who's with us today to give additional information, and I ask for a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you, and I would like to welcome Mayor Scott uh, here today. Welcome, Mayor Scott. You can go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for having me. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair and Honorable Members of the Committee. I am Mayor Scott uh, from Baltimore, testifying in full support of HB 1276. want to start by thanking Delegate Attar for pushing this very important issue that establishes a youth data hub that will greatly improve uh, the quality of life of what I call Baltimore's most precious resource and asset, and that's our young people. Uh, the statistics in Baltimore alarm. Uh, there are more than 18,000 young people disconnected from school and work. And over the past five years, 208 children have died in the city, predominantly vulnerable in, uh, infants and children and uh, teens struggling in schools and involved with the juvenile justice system. As you heard uh, from a delegate of TAR, one of the biggest travesties is that we know these young people are getting services from organizations across the city, but right now they cannot share that data and information. And being able to do so uh, would create an integrated data system, linking data across you serving organizations and to an anonymous system uh, subject to community oversight and strict guidelines so that we can improve the quality of life outcomes for all of our young people. It brings together communities, uh, providers, policymakers, researchers into partnership to make informed decisions as they create and implement programs and policies designed to eliminate disparities and help our young people achieve the best version of themselves. Uh, through this data hub, we are adding a world-class IT capacity to our data systems by partnering with technological experts who have the experience in both securing and making this data anonymous. We will create both the technical infrastructure required to protect this information, but also the analytical, analytical capacity to turn that data into action. Being able to use data and analysis to understand how our work has impacted uh, these young people and their families is a foundational thing that we need. Data is a public trust and being good stewards of that data uh, resource entails not just protecting it, but seeking the most effective and ethical means for leveraging it. We can do both. We can share this data. We can improve the lives of young people and their families. We can end uh, decades old uh, inability to talk across systems so that our taxpayer dollars, our uh, dollars from philanthropy are not wasted and we are, are improving these lives that we are not doing right now simply because we cannot share information and talk about these young people in an informed way. And with that, uh, I will say that we cannot afford to leave any opportunity to improve uh, services for young people on the table. And I respectfully request a favorable report on HB 1276. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I do see a question, Delegate Buckle. Yeah, I had a question, I, I guess, for a delegate at TAR. This sounds like a pretty good concept, like a, a very common sense, good government concept. And I'm wondering, is there something about it that's unique to Baltimore City? 
or is this something that that could be implemented in other communities, particularly in, in maybe underserved communities, which in our state are are both urban and, and rural, uh, have some socioeconomic challenges. Is there something particular about this system uh, that's idiosyncratic to Baltimore City, or could we look at this as a model to maybe use other places? So thank you for that question. The way the bill is drafted, it's particular to Baltimore City because it includes Baltimore City government, Baltimore Promise, and the Baltimore City schools. Um, I don't see why something like this cannot take place in other jurisdictions. I know Baltimore City has been researching this for several years, um, so, but I don't know, and I know it will work for Baltimore City. I don't know how it will work with other jurisdictions. Thank you. Delegate Branch. Thanks, Madam Chair, um, and thanks, Delegate Attar, for the bill. Uh, my question is that I know that it's only for Baltimore City, but um, I do believe that it will include Department of Human Resources or Human Services now. Um, so with the kids leaving from Baltimore City and going to other jurisdictions, how will those different counties, um, will they also be allowed to use the same system when children are being transferred into Baltimore City? So that's a very good question and thank you for it. I do not know the answer to it. I don't know if the mayor would know the answer, but that's something that we could definitely look into. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Delegate, my delegate for the question. Uh, I think Delegate right now is particular to when we are serving those young people in Baltimore. And I think uh, Delegate Buckle brought up a very good point about maybe thinking about how this we can look at this statewide because we know of these kind of issues and we know that there are organizations like Baltimore's Promise, nonprofit partners working in jurisdictions across the state in the same way. And we really have to think about that. But this uh, in particular is about when we're serving those young people in Baltimore City through those government and nonprofit and in the school system together uh, so that we can wrap our arms around them. But uh, I think uh, this could be the model for what we can do across the state. Uh, Vice, Chair, Vice Chair Washington. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair, and good to see you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, happy, great. I'm proud of all the work that you're doing in Baltimore and really, really appreciate all the hard work that you're putting into the city. Um, can I just ask a simple question, Delegate Attar? What, why, why do, why can't this be done with city, with, through the city right now? Why do we need a state bill for this? Thank you for the question. So I actually believe um, the fiscal note goes into a little bit detail about that, but currently they cannot, for privacy reasons, by law, they cannot share the information. So this bill would allow them to now be able to share the data. Because each agent, each of these agencies that were listed, they collect the data already. It's just a matter of sharing it. Got it. So the current law prevents them from being able to share and access each other's information on that student. So it creates like this kind of hub for one location for all this data. That's correct, and, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you. And, and if I may, Madam Chair, in the simplest form, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, think about it like this. You have a school that has a rec center attached to it and that rec center has a nonprofit partner. Uh, that nonprofit partner does after school reading and tutoring, right? And you have a young person who comes from that school, goes to that rec center, but doesn't even participate in that program because guess what? No one at the rec center can actually know unless that young person's self says, hey, I need help in reading. They don't say anything. And it's a, it's a loophole that I've been working to close for many, many years, as Delegate Attar said. And I think that with you guys' support, we'll be able to do that and really improve on how we're working for our young people and families. Got it. And, and my last question, Madam Chair, I, I can't see the bill. It's not printed in front of me right now, but I was able to read it here. Is this a local delegation bill? It is. OK, perfect. Thank you. Yes, it is. And at, 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 go ahead. I know you think you're you about to answer my last question. Go ahead. If I may add, this bill was heard in the local delegation at our last meeting on Friday, and it'll be voted on tomorrow. So I look forward to sending the favorable report to committee. Awesome. Thank you for that. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, seeing none. Thank you, delegate. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And that concludes the testimony on House Bill 1276. House Bill 1281, Delegate Rose, and there is one person signed up after you who will have two minutes. Whenever you're ready, Delegate Rose. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, committee members. Uh, for the record, Delegate April Rose from Carroll County, District 5, here to support and present House Bill 1281. 
Um, this bill will establish a process and procedure for the recall of an elected member of a county board of education. This would not apply to any appointed members or to any student members. I know some counties uh, do have appointed members or a hybrid system. I just want to say on the record, this, is, this bill was not brought um, as a result of my board of education in Carroll County. I just want to say that on the record, we have a wonderful board of, of uh education in Carroll who have worked very hard and tirelessly as many have throughout the state, especially during the past couple of years. Um, but in what we have seen nationwide um, and what we have learned through the pandemic is uh, sometimes you have to look forward to possible problems and pitfalls um, based on circumstances. And we've certainly have seen that across the country. So that was the, uh, the reason for bringing the bill. Um, the process would be, um, and you can certainly read it, it was very well spelled out in the fiscal note. Um, the elected member would be subject to recall by the voters of the county who are currently qualified to vote for the successor. Um, you would have to notify the voters. You would have to notify the, the member the reason for the recall there would be um, a, an opportunity for uh, the person to respond and there would be a process put in place for um, publishing it in the newspaper, um, letting the voters know, letting the members know and moving forward with this recall election. Um, I know that uh, just to address the fiscal note and I'm sure my board of elections uh, in Carroll uh, would be, you know, not really very happy, but um, it's stating it could cost about $12 million to perform such an election. I, I sort of feel that um, by having this process in place and knowing that there is a recourse, I feel that we probably would not have to go through this process very often at all, because there would be the opportunity for um, certainly the discussion uh, that the elected officials would know that this is a possibility. And my hope is that it would um, bring better communication, uh, better responses back and forth between parents and the elected school boards so that we would not have to go down this road. But I do think it's an important tool and uh, wanted to bring this bill forward. And I look forward to any questions um, about this particular legislation. And I thank you for your time and I hope that you will consider giving it a favorable report. Thank you. Next for two minutes, uh, John Willems, please. Madam Chair, members of the committee, John Willems representing the Maryland Association of Boards of Education, urging an unfavorable report on House Bill 1281. Um, want to speak uh, to uh, uh, my admiration for the service that each of you provide as members of the General Assembly. The Maryland is not uh, generally a recall state re regarding uh, the service of elected officials, uh, and, uh, and we respect the electoral process uh, that every four years the voters have that, uh, have that choice. That said, as my testimony points out with regard to members of boards of education, uh, there are interim measures that can be taken. And just as recently as uh, the last month, uh, we saw the state board issue opinions uh, regarding the uh, requested uh, removal for cause of members of local boards of education. And so there are standards applied, uh, standards of review, and there is a process uh, in place for doing so. But also emphasize the complexity of the role of local board members, uh, respecting your legislative role. In addition to a legislative role, members of boards of education have a quasi-judicial role and an executive function. So consider the executive function of hiring the superintendent and uh, recall uh, uh, measures uh, being advanced by folks who object to that decision or folks who are on the losing end of quasi-judicial opinions on appeal to boards of education. So myriad avenues uh, to generate uh, recall petitions that we believe would be disruptive and unhelpful uh, overall and again, urge an unfavorable report. Thank you. Thank you. Questions, Delegate Buckle. Thank you, Madam Chair. And if I recall correctly, I, I try to follow the news, but I, I don't follow it terribly closely, but they have these types of procedures a lot of other places. Like, didn't they just do this in San Francisco where the voters of San Francisco had the opportunity to recall and, and, and turn out several members of their school board? I don't know if Delegate Rose is aware of that or Mr. Willem's yes. one. 
yes, I, I'm definitely aware. And, um, you know, that is part of what has come out, you know, over the past uh, almost two years, or maybe it is two years um, across the nation, there have been um, a lot of parents who have been very unsatisfied with either their treatment at Board of Education meetings, um, the lack of communication, and the, the general feeling of the lack of respect over, um, you know, the the teaching of our children and having the recourse to speak to the Board of Education. And so while again, I do not think that uh, this will be something that is rampant, and again, it's not a reflex reflection on my county and um, maybe many of your counties, but I think it's an important tool in the toolbox to protect uh, you know, parents' rights and having this as a recourse, you know, certainly maybe as a last resort, I think is an important thing to consider and to have um, available. But thank you for the question. Okay, that's what I just want to say. I, I thought I remembered that, that they even have this process in places like San Francisco. So yes, thank correct. you. Correct. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Delegate Rose or Mr. Willems? Seeing none, thank you, Delegate Rose. That concludes the testimony on House Bill 1281. Calling Delegate Rose, House Bill 1287, and there is one person after you who will have two minutes. Whenever you're ready, Delegate. Thank you again, Madam Chair. I don't know that if this counts as Rose Palooza. I don't think I've reached the level of buckle, but um, thank you for my third bill today. Um, here to support House Bill 1287. Um, this is the Curriculum Transparency Act of 2022. I know that we on this committee have already heard several bills uh, concerning curriculum transparency. But this, this bill, um, as presented, would require public schools to create and update a detailed list of the curriculum and instructional materials used in the school for that school year. In addition, um, it would have to maintain on the homepage of the website a link to the curriculum, the titles, author, creators, and publishers of the books, and any other materials used, a phone number and email address for the appropriate individual at the school, county board and department who can respond to questions, concerns, and recommendations about curriculums and materials. An electronic form created by the school would be uh, used also to submit those complaints. In addition, starting on August 1st of 2023 and each year thereafter, each county board would report the number of complaints received. And in addition, on September 1st of 2023 and thereafter, we provide a report to us here in the General Assembly. This bill as presented, if a county board would fail to comply with the requirements of the bill, the state superintendent with the approval of the state board would notify the comptroller who would withhold 1% of the next installment of the general state school fund until the superintendent notifies the comptroller that the board is in full compliance. Now, I do want to state, again, um, I am not stating that this is a problem. I will say, you know, in Carroll County, and as Delegate Luke, he brought out uh, on the floor on discussion of another bill, uh, we are doing a very good job of that in Carroll County. And um, so this is not a Carroll County bill, and it's not a reflection on what we do. You know, I did my own check and went through the process to look at what was on the website and what is available. Um, so, but I would like to see every school um, do a great job of providing that transparency. I think it's extremely important for our parents to not have to jump through a lot of hoops and to easily be able to see what their children are being taught, what materials are being used. Um, and uh, in addition, I have had some feedback from the teaching community. And I, if this committee would feel that they would like to move forward with this or any of the curriculum bills, um, I do, I would certainly be amenable to amending the bill um, to take away some of the teacher concerns with the overdue, you know, the burden of having to go down and maybe too deep of a level with what they are doing on a daily basis. I have great appreciation and admiration for our teaching community who have done a fantastic job over the past two years during terrible circumstances. So I'd be very happy to move forward working with the teaching community and coming up with a bill that everyone could be happy with. Um, with that, um, I just will end my testimony and happy to answer any questions. And thank you for the, the opportunity. Questions? Well, nope, sorry. There's one other person jumping the gun. Matt Lankford for two minutes. Is Mr. Lankford in? Yes. Okay, go um, ahead, sir. Yes, can you hear me? Okay, good. Um, I would like to thank the committee for giving me the opportunity to testify today. 
over, um, I'm from Somerset County, Maryland, and over the last 500 plus days, I have challenged my son's ninth grade English one honors curriculum. I've appealed to the superintendent uh, of Somerset County Public Schools decision to keep the books in the curriculum. Uh, I'm still waiting to address the school board about the dirty books being taught in my son's class. He is now halfway through the 10th grade. And you may ask, what does this have to do with curriculum transparency? Well, part of the problem is just that, transparency. Um, uh, I would have had saved a great amount of time if this was on a website where I could view my son's curriculum, the materials in it. Um, you can see um, curriculum transparency. Um, I could see it like he's down to 10th grade, but I could look at the 11th grade and see what he's about to um, learn. There might be some subtle changes, but pretty much it'll be the same. Um, and here's my point, and this is why I'm for the transparency. It protects everyone. It protects the children by informing the parents what they're gonna learn. It protects the teachers. There's no surprises or hidden agendas. It also protects the administration by holding the system accountable. Imagine if you could, everybody could see the books, they would probably be very careful of what books they do use. And it protects the Board of Ed as well, the citizens of the county from lawsuits. Transparency should eliminate secrets and hidden agendas so everyone knows up front what they're being taught. Now, in my opinion, I found many inappropriate books in Somerset County, and you know I'm appealing them like I was saying, but there's an example of a citizen that sent a request in, a FOIA request for the curriculum, and the superintendent responded back to her saying that it would almost be $40,000 to get what she asked for, and she would have to pay half of it up front. Um, I don't know if you all have the letter or not, but I did send it with with my um, written notice. But um, with that, I um, that. I'm Mr. Mr. Langford, I'm going to have to ask you to wrap up your testimony, please. Yeah, yeah. So I'm completely for the transparency. Um, and, it, you know, um, I do have the letter. I, I don't know if you got it or not. But if you if you don't, I'll be glad to send it to you guys to show you how how unacceptable that is. Thank you for your time. Thank you. There are a couple questions. Delegate Boatler, then Delegate Wilkins. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is for the sponsor of the bill. Uh, and, and looking at the bill, it seems like what you're, you're asking for, and I just want to make sure that, that that's what I'm reading, it, it, it's pretty much just a, a, a general kind of overall these are the books we're using. This is the curricula that is going to be up there. Um, it doesn't seem that you have like, you know, each individual teacher, um, you know, has a lot of leeway. At least that's my understanding. And, and uh, what books they can use and, uh, you know, and what they do on a day to day basis. It, it, none of that is included in this bill. So oh, I've gotten some feedback and as I've kind of read through it, I think that there, it, it could be, this is patterned after a bill from um, North Carolina. And I think that as you read it, it could seem that teachers might be overburdened with having to publish their individual lesson plans um, and really uh, getting into far more detail. I, I would say what my, my true intention would be is, is really how Carroll County uh, handles it. So when you follow Carroll County's links, um, we, pr we pretty much do everything that, that I'm intending in this bill. Um, when you go through Carroll County and you click on the links, you can see what the classes are, what the books will be, you know, what materials are being used. And it's very, very easy to navigate. It's also very easy to get a phone number um, to reach out with questions. So um, you know, just in light and my feedback from some teachers that I've interacted with is if there needs to be language amended to make it less onerous on teachers, I would certainly be open to doing that. Um, they have been, uh, been through the mill over the past two years. So I don't want to do anything that would be a, a large burden to the teaching community. That's not the intent, but I, I thank you for the question. Yeah, th thank you. And, and, and I appreciate your answer. 
Um, but what really are the parents looking for? And that would be my concern. I'm a, a co-sponsor of your bill, mm -hmm. and I think it's an it's an excellent bill. And because I had sponsored one locally for Baltimore County. And the thing that I have gotten back from parents is that that's exactly what they want to know, what the curricula, uh, mm -hmm. you know, what are they putting up there day to day? What are what are they teaching on a day to day basis? And look, they have to do that planning anyhow. I, I'm not sure that that's a burden on them because my wife's a teacher and, you know, she plans way out ahead of you know, a lot of times. And the longer you're teaching, you have these plans from day to day that you can, um, you know, let people know uh, what you're doing. Because my concern is, is that if this is too broad of what we do, I still think parents are not going to get the transparency that they desperately want to have. Um, so I hope that, you know, uh, as we move forward with this, that um, I hope that we can find a way and, you know, that we can maybe balance that act between the teachers, the parents, and what we're expecting uh, from the school system itself. Would you agree with that? Or I think that's perfectly reasonable. And I think that if we would get the input from teachers as to, you know, what could be done that wouldn't be overly burdensome, but would also uh, be very helpful to parents, I think that would be a great compromise. And I appreciate your thoughts and I agree with you. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate Wilkins. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Delegate, for bringing this bill. I have a question for Mr. Lankford, and Mr. Lankford, I'm not, I'm not sure um, if your camera is working. We're not able to see you, um, but I do have a question for you. Um, yeah. you so something that you mentioned kind of piqued my interest. You mentioned dirty books. Yes, Could you? Oh, there you are. Could you um, please just share a little bit more about what would be in the list of dirty books and what you consider dirty books? I was just curious about that. Yes. Um, books that have um, uh, sexual content describing situations that are, I feel, unacceptable. Um, one of the books uh, that I'm referring to, am I allowed to mention one of the books? Sure is all boys aren't blue. Um, and if you want, I call them dirty books. I mean, you know, I'm an old guy. So <laughs> but what what I'm saying is, is if, if you want to go to um, the books that I'm referring to, you can go to YouTube under Matt Langford. And I have some videos that will walk you through it and show you some, what I'm talking about. Profanity to the utmost degree. I mean, they use the f bomb. It's 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 amazing some of the books that are being uh, put in our schools that is listed under young adult. Uh, it's got a lot of sexual um, situations. They're just I call them dirty books. And Mr. Langford, I did get a chance to just Google "All Boys Aren't Blue." I'd actually never heard of that book, but it looks like on Amazon. It's a book by a journalist and LGBTQ activist. That is correct. Okay, well, thank you so much. And I think for transparency, I think it would be good to be able to see you as well. So we appreciate that. And thank you for answering my question and your advocacy. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you, Delegate Rose. And that concludes the testimony on House Bill 1287. Now calling House Bill 1327, Delegate Bandari, welcome. And there are two folks after you who will have, oh no, one, there's just one, because you signed yourself up. Okay, there's one person after you who will have two minutes. So whenever you're ready, Delegate. Yeah, thank you, Chair Atterbury and members of the Ways and uh, Means uh, Committee. This is, uh, for the record, this is uh, Delegate um, Harry Bandari uh, from uh, District 8 uh, with the um, Bill 1327 Home and Hospital Teaching Program for Student Report. Uh, in short, this bill would create a group to study the Home and Hospital Teaching Program here in our state and determine if enough is being done to reintegrate students back into traditional schools 
The home and hospital program is an educational service for students who have medical, physical, and or disciplinary challenges. When students are experiencing physical or emotional condition that make it impossible for them to attend school, this program lets them continue their education. However, the program must be improved. And needless to say, in the last two years, we have all been on a crash course in virtual instruction and learning from home. As it exists now, the program does not prepare students for reintegration into a classroom learning environment, especially in the cases presented by students whose behavior or emotional condition makes it difficult uh, for uh, them to attend school. These students remain out of school for excessive periods of time. And often when they do return to a classroom, the school is not prepared with an adequate re-entry plan. This is not just traumatic for the student, but it is traumatic for everyone around them. The goals of this bill, which passed the House unanimously in 2019, uh, are fivefold: to require the Maryland State Department of Education to assess whether a student in home and hospital teaching program are receiving adequate support and instruction time to successfully transition back to classroom to require the Department of Education to analyze whether local school system have sufficient staffing to coordinate instructional services for students to study whether transition plan for students returning to the classroom should be implemented. And if so, the viability of having school counselor lead and develop those plans to assess whether any transition plans should be reviewed or evaluated by a licensed medical professional prior to implementation and to make recommendation regarding any, um, any regulatory changes to the home and hospital teaching program for student. On and off, during the last two years, students have been learning away from the classroom. I think it is a fair to say that there are some things we have learned regarding education outside of a classroom setting that can be used to bolster the home and hospital program. We need to see exactly where the program struggle so that we may address those difficulties as efficiently and mindfully as possible in the future. In light of all this, I request a favorable report. Thank you. And next for two minutes, Dana Bergman, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my name is Dana Bergman, and I'm in speaking on behalf of myself as an individual and not as um, my committee that I serve on in Seaside, California. Um, I am actually the only parent in Baltimore County Public Schools history to have all three children participate in the home and hospital program for an extended amount of time. In addition to the challenges that we all face due to COVID, um, one of those children ended up returning back into the home and hospital program. Um, because of my husband's service in the US Army, my child um, that was in home and hospital transition due to um, military service. Now, military children are um, supported under the Interstate Compact Act. Maryland State was one of the first states to actually sign on to that act to protect military children when they have to move due to no fault of their own and their parents' service um, to this country. Now, what I know from experience is a lot of the communication of what that program entail for supporting the child did not get transferred over into the new state. And it kind of hurt my child accessing and meeting his social emotional needs. Now, this, this is gonna be a problem because if you look at all 24 jurisdictions in the state of Maryland, they don't communicate with each other as far as the home and hospital program on how is it uniquely catered in each jurisdiction. And this is a program that students need to have, and we have the responsibility to be good stewards to protect these very vulnerable students, to make sure that we're being adequate and equally distributing access to these services and that communication is there for that successful transition. Because if we don't work and do that together, we're, we're all failing them. So I hope that there is a favorable um, vote from everybody here 
um, to support children, not just in Maryland, but supporting them and providing that, those additional details if they have to move cross country or, or to a different state. Thank you. For any questions, Delegate Boatler, is your hand from before? Okay. Okay, seeing no questions. Thank you, Delegate Bandari. That concludes the testimony on House Bill 1327. Thank you. Thank you. Calling House Bill 1277, Delegate Belcastro, and there are three individuals signed up to testify uh, after you who will have two minutes each. So whenever you're ready, Delegate. Thank you so much, Chair Atterbury, Vice Chair Washington, members of the Ways and Means Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to present House Bill 1277, uh, State Department of Education Assessment Study and Report. I've been a special educator for the last 10 years, and it's my highest priority um, to ensure that our, the students I serve get the, the supports they need to thrive. I work hard um, to help my students meet their IEP goals, and I deeply appreciate the importance of measuring their progress. However, I've also experienced firsthand the impact of um, disrupting daily learning for standardized assessments and shuffling schedules often causes confusion and impacts students' ability to fully participate. Too much time spent on testing robs students from a well-rounded education by pulling them out of courses in art, physical education, music, and more. Teachers and aides often are often called out of their, their regular classes to proctor exams, and for students with IEPs, this inconsistency can interfere with the support that they are legally entitled to. When assessments take up too much time, students face increased stress and less time for one-on-one -on -one support, field trips, hand-on learning experiences. Some standardized assessments result, or I'm sorry, some standardized assessment results can also take months or longer to reach educators. So we often can't even use that data when planning our lessons. Mm -hmm. Nearly five years ago, the General Assembly passed the More Learning, Less Testing Act, and it was designed to limit the amount of testing Maryland educators and students must complete each year and focus on creating practical testing schedules. Last year, the Blueprint for Maryland's Future passed, which among, um, which among many other important measures, requires the State Department of Education to review certain assessments for cultural bias. Now, by gathering data by, from MSDE and district committees on assessment, we can highlight best practices for testing and provide local school systems with the information they need to make assessments as useful and least disruptive as possible. We have made important improvements, but there is more to be done, and this study will measure the progress we've already made and provide valuable perspective from our educators on the front lines of this issue to inform our next steps. So thank you for the opportunity to present House Bill 1277, and we respectfully ask for your favorable report. Thanks so much. Thank you. Next, Lauren Lamb for two minutes, please. You're on mute, Ms. Lamp. There you go. I am muted. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. I am representing the Maryland State Education Association in support of House Bill 1277. And I first want to share a story from Kristen DeMarinville, a Charles County testing coordinator and 15 year educator. She told me that a ninth grade student has come to her office repeatedly with anxiety before MCAP exams he has to take, asking her, what happens if I get all A's in my classes, but I fail the MCAP? I'm not a good test taker and I get very nervous. Will I fail the ninth grade? This student wants to do well and should enjoy being back in school learning with his peers, but frequent testing is leaving him anxious and worried he will fail the ninth grade. On top of the anxiety, excessive testing can cause students. Educators are often pulled from their classes to proctor tests, disrupting instruction to their students, sometimes for days at a time. The time invested in assessments does not just include the test itself. Educators spend days preparing students for the test format, and then there is time spent on directions, troubleshooting technology issues, collecting cell phones from students, and passing out and collecting materials. Students can end up in testing sessions for three hours at a time, and students with accommodations, such as those who get time and a half, can end up sitting for 4.5 hours at a time or longer. We appreciate the progress that has been made on this issue, including the passage of the More Learning, Less Testing Act of 2017 and the Blueprint for Maryland's Future, but it's clear that we can and must do more to improve testing. 
We thank Delegate Bell Castro for bringing attention to this issue and for being so responsive to the concerns of educators. And we urge the committee to issue a favorable report on House Bill 1277. Thank you. Next, Celia Burton, please, for two minutes. That's me. Good afternoon. My name is Celia Burton. I've been a test coordinator at Benjamin Tasker Middle School in Prince George's County for more than 20 years. I am here on behalf of MSEA um, House Bill 1277. First, I want to acknowledge that assessments are valuable for classroom professionals to examine and plan for instruction, but improvements are necessary. My experience with testing and its impact on students and educators is over scheduling of assessments. Like in my school district, over 170 county assessments are on our school year calendar. As state assessments are added for students in their prospective subject and grade level, local school districts like mine creates quarterly assessments for students. This creates a major problem because it takes time from classroom instruction to examine data and plan for exam instruction. Classroom teachers today come to, come to their prospective school buildings with one thing on your mind, testing, testing, testing. This impacts progress in teaching. Our students are drained and frustrated when participating in regular courses because most of the time they're taking a test. Gone are the days of planning a science lesson and creating um, experiments for students, teaching math calculations or having great discussions about learning and asking questions, higher, asking higher order thinking questions. I know from firsthand, most of all, testing companies mislead school districts regarding the allotted testing time it should take for students to complete their assessments. My wonderings are, when are teachers expected to examine their student data and create lessons to drive instruction from data utilization? In conclusion, if students are to be assessed, then why does it take why, why so many assessments? Why not share the data with stakeholders in a timely fashion? Students are no longer assessed using paper and pencil. All assessments are computer-based. As testing corporations are being paid millions of dollars by school systems to purchase their testing materials, why does it still take four to five months for schools to receive student um, testing reports while teachers wait for data to improve instruction. On behalf of Maryland State Education Association, I urge, I urge the committee to issue a favorable report on House Bill 1277. Thank you. Oh, and I, there, Sean Johnson. Oh, I see you. There you are. Hi. <laughs> okay, two minutes. Hi, thank you, Madam Chair, members of uh, the Ways and Means Committee. It's great to see you all. Uh, Sean Johnson, Executive Director at the Maryland State Education Association. Lauren and Ms. Burton provided our testimony. I largely wanted to be here to help um, answer any questions if there are any. Obviously, MSEA worked closely with Delegate Ebersol and a bipartisan group of uh, members of this committee and the entire General Assembly in 2017 to pass the More Learning, Less Testing Act. Since that time, I do think it's important to note that there have been new mandated tests that Maryland will be rolling out in its in their entirety this school year will be the first administration of the MCAP, the Maryland Comprehensive Assessment Program. The blueprint also required new testing related to college and career readiness and required the, career, uh, the kindergarten readiness assessment to be a census test rather than a uh, sampling test. So there have been adjustments made in testing protocols since the More Learning, Less Testing Act was passed. And this is a prudent and important uh, step to take and we think Delegate Bel Castro for introducing the bill and obviously stand ready to answer any questions and hopefully urge uh, your favorable action on uh, House Bill 1277. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 1277. Thank you. Thank you. House Bill 12. 56, Delegate Chisholm, and then there are a handful of folks after you who will have two minutes to testify whenever you're ready, Delegate. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the Ways and Means Committee. And uh, I'd like to move favorable on Delegate Bell Castro's bill because I was a terrible test taker. Um, for the record, I'm Delegate Brian Chisholm here to present HB 1256, which is the Ending Discrimination in Public Education Act of 2022. 
The bill seeks to do one thing and one thing only, and that is to preserve a high standard learning environment that fosters intellectual growth, problem solving, critical thinking, understanding, respect for others, and empathy in a way that seeks to unify, unite, and not divide. I can guarantee everybody on this committee one thing and everybody that's listening, and that is that every one of you is an undeniable statistical miracle. We can strip away the spiritual stuff, but just focusing on the science, scientists and mathematicians have calculated the odds of you being exactly you being born is one in 400 trillion. That's the equivalent of winning the $100 million lottery 10 times in your life. This goes without saying that you are a miracle. And I also believe that every single person has a purpose in life. That purpose is not always going to be crystal clear. It's not simple. It's not painless or easy to understand all the time. But I do believe without a shadow of a doubt that everyone here has a reason. That is why when we were talking about our children and students, we must foster a spirit of limitless possibilities for whatever they wish to become or achieve. Long ago, I heard Oprah Winfrey share a video about what she called the secret. And I watched it and it always stuck with me and guided me at times. In short, it explains that your brain is so powerful that it can subconsciously help you achieve anything you ever dream, but you have to consistently and vividly envision where you wanna go in your head. It may not be the way you expected to get there, but it will get you there. That is why I abjectly reject the idea that any one person, race, sex, creed, or culture is inferior or superior to another and discrimination should be eliminated and avoided at all costs. And that's what this bill seeks to do. Contrary to the inferences made in several pieces of the unfavorable written testimony that I read, I do believe we should never shy away from teaching history. We should always embrace history and we should learn from it. The good, the bad, the ugly, the evil, and the triumphs. That's why I believe this is what we embrace and grow so we can involve, evolve into a better, stronger, and more peaceful society. That is why I put this bill forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Next for two minutes, Belinda Lawson, please. Ms. Lawson, you're on mute. There we go. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and the members of the Ways um, and Means Committee. Uh, for allowing me to speak today. I really appreciate it. Um, I am here in my support or um, I support House Bill 1256. Um, first, I'm gonna start off with the definition of discrimination, uh, the undressed or prejudice, prejudicial treatment of different categories of people, things, especially on the grounds of race, age, or sex. I don't know about you guys, but that's all I've been hearing for the last two years not only from parents, students, but also teachers. Um, I've heard stories of teachers being put into rooms um, under the training for equity and inclusion and being taught because you're from my county, which is Carroll County. If you're from Carroll County, you must be racist. Um, that kind of thing to me, that's discrimination. And that's coming, I mean, that's happening to the teachers. So then the teachers, and, and this is all things that have been witnessed. And just last evening, we had a student come to one of our board meetings um, and he basically told our board members that CRT is actually in our schools. Uh, he gave them examples um, of what he's experienced. And, you know, he's right. He basically said just because he's white doesn't mean he's privileged. He had a, I guess he had a lesson in which you know, it was things literally written down on a paper. If you're this, if you're that, if you're this, you are automatically privileged. I don't understand how putting people in groups by race or, um, you know, living conditions automatically means that you're privileged or that you're not. I just, I just think that's basically the definition of racism, actually. Um, you know, I grew up, my mom always taught me two wrongs don't make a right. We've already experienced slavery and we know how that went. 
I don't understand why that's being taught in class. It just almost seems like we're teaching kids to be racist. Um, we cannot claim to eliminate discrimination and then replace that with discrimination. To me, that doesn't make sense. We're currently living in emotionally driven time where things that's happening outside of our classroom are being brought into the classroom, either by the Lawson, students or- Ms. Lawson, can you wrap up your testimony, please? Yes. Um, basically, two wrongs don't make a right. Um, you can't discriminate against people and then claim to eliminate discrimination. So I support this bill 100%. Thank you. Thank you. Next, the unfavorables. Stephanie Franklin, please. A good afternoon. I'm Stephanie Franklin. I'm president and CEO of the Franklin Law Group and we represent children in six jurisdictions across the state of Maryland in abuse and neglect proceedings. I'm also co-counsel on a federal class action lawsuit uh, for the plaintiffs, representing the plaintiffs for children in foster care in Baltimore City, roughly over 2,000 children. And I vehemently oppose this bill. This bill is an insult and it is an insult of epic proportions. It claims to seek to eliminate discrimination, but what it is actually doing is being discriminatory. It is a bill that is covertly discriminatory. It censors uh, educators and administrators ability to shape young minds, which is their responsibility. And it attempts to hide the ball and continue to teach inaccurate history and not actually dissect the reasons why there are so many racial and ethnic disparities today. I heard a delegate say who's sponsoring this bill that we should allow our children to develop and basically self-determine and that their, their opportunities and the way they could de develop could be limitless. But clearly teaching the way we have been teaching without critically examining the past, which has been inaccurately told and has been a, a monolithic voice that did not include voices who bore the brunt of the suffering and the systemic and institutional racism, oppression and discrimination in this country is a disgrace. My sister, one of my sisters is a middle school principal in Baltimore County. And when she saw that horrible fiasco, disgraceful fiasco that happened on January 6th at the Capitol, a ton of her middle school students who were approximately what, 11 to 13 years old, reached out to her because her, the school that she's at is a mixed school, predominantly African-American with other groups of students as well, and said, how did they get away with that? If those were black people, there would have been more police there and they would have been shot and killed. Franklin, that is what those young children said. Franklin, so, can you wrap, wrap up your testimony? I can wrap it up. So I am saying this and I'm saying it very strongly. I wanna leave you with a quote that was quoted by Brian Stevenson, the esteemed executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative. He said that fiascos like that happen when a country fails to acknowledge its shame. If we want to live up to the quote unquote exceptionalism that we like to export around the world and say that we are, let's teach accurate history. Let's teach, let's bring all voices and experiences and histories into the fold because that is gonna make us a better country and it's gonna strengthen the minds and the abilities and the limits that our children can go to. Thank you. Shandrika Rennell, please, for two minutes. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Atterbury and members of the Ways and Means Committee. My name is Shandrika Rennell and I'm the immediate past president and here on behalf of J. Franklin Bourne Bar Association serving Prince George's and Montgomery counties. And we are here to oppose House Bill 1256. The language of House Bill 1256 is overly broad, racist, sexist, and is not good education law. House Bill 1256 fails to define what, con what makes a concept discriminatory and therefore could potentially restrict and control the teaching of topics that address not only African-American history, but all minority races and women. History like the Holocaust, the apartheid, and the fight for the passing of the 19th Amendment. 
House Bill 1256 will hinder these parts of history because the explicit racism and sexism embedded in them is by nature discriminatory. House Bill 1256 is racist and sexist. It silences marginalized minorities through the white supremacy framework by further dictating, micromanaging, and dominating how someone else's history should be taught, and in turn making the history politically correct or easier to digest. The intent of House Bill 1256 is that the legislature would rather not force the racial and gender majority to have to deal with or understand the reality of racism or sexism, a choice that people of color and women don't have the luxury to escape. It has been said that past behavior is a perfect predictor of future behavior. Without addressing the oppression, exploitation, and injustices of history through education and conversation, these concepts will continue to repeat themselves. Lastly, House Bill is not good education law. Maryland requires teachers to provide culturally responsive education, including concepts like global awareness, social justice, and social responsibility. House Bill 1256 restricts instructors' autonomy in educating in a culturally responsive manner, impedes on their ability to address, challenge, or respond to students' curiosity regarding racial and sexual discriminatory concepts. In conclusion, we ask that you move unfavorable to House Bill 1256, as the bill is overly broad and perpetuates the exact thing it is meant to prevent racism and sexism. Thank you. I don't know if she, I don't see her. Claudia Remington, are you on with us? She's still here. Okay, thank you, Haley. Are there any questions for the bill sponsor or any of the witnesses? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 1256. Next, House Bill 1301, Delegate Corman, and there are six folks after you who will have two minutes each. So whenever you're ready, Delegate Corman. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, for the record, Delegate Mark Corman presenting HB 1301, uh, which involves non-public, the misnamed non-public educational programs, children with disabilities, cost of teacher services. Uh, this bill will require the state and county to provide teachers to, again, the misnamed non-public special education programs uh, to ensure that teachers have a salary that's equivalent to salaries received in the typical uh, public schools. Uh, as, as this committee knows, non-public placement programs are used to support special needs students with an IEP, so with an IEP through their local school system, uh, who have needs that cannot be met in the public schools. Uh, so the, you know, to try to briefly explain, the public school system places these students into these non-public schools and the school system pays for them. Uh, so these schools, which are predominantly made up of publicly funded students, exist in about 13 of our counties, and many students cross jurisdictional lines for their schooling. For example, the Linwood School in Howard County currently serves 49 students, all of whom are publicly funded from a local school district. Uh, and in that case, students come from at least eight different uh, Maryland jurisdictions. The school does not actually accept, in that case, private pay students. Um, I'm more familiar with Ivy Mount. That's about 96% uh, publicly funded students from uh, Maryland, Virginia, and D.C., I'm familiar with it because um, my son goes there. Uh, you know, many of you know Harrison from social media or meeting him here. Uh, he's in a fourth grade program there and actually one of his teachers, uh, Ms. Bell is who you're gonna hear from uh, shortly behind me. Um, the cost of educating these children is shared by the local jurisdiction and the state. The local jurisdiction pays to the special needs school, the local share of a calculated basic cost uh, to educate a non-special needs student plus 200%. Uh, and if there's a difference between that cost uh, and the cost of the school, which is approved the, by the Maryland State Department of Education, uh, that's split 70% state, 30% uh, local funds. The purpose of HR 1301, HB 1301, is to address and rectify the pay disparity between non-public special education teachers and public school special education teachers. And again, all the students that are at issue here are paid for by uh, public tax dollars. The salary disparity ranges from $8 an hour to $27 an hour between public school rates. And when calculated as a percentage, uh, this ranges from 23.3% to 40.7% uh, below the typical public school system rate. That means that a teacher in a classroom at my local public elementary school may be making 23.3% to 40.7% uh, more than a teacher at a local special needs elementary school, even if all of the students in both classrooms are part of the publicly funded program. HB 1301 requires a non-public special needs school to pay teachers a salary that's equivalent to public school teachers of similar training and experience in the same county. This would be paid for under the same uh, breakdown 70-30 approach described above, uh, which is a mix of local and state resources. Last year, the legislature passed HB 1365, which provided a one year of additional funding to help fill the pay gap 
and at the same time requested a report on a sustainable ongoing solution from the Maryland State Department of Education. The bill before you represents one of the proposed options in that report, which I'm happy to share with any member who's interested. It's about 30 pages. Um, you know, publicly funded special needs students deserve the best education possible. And in order to uh, provide that, we have to make sure special education teachers working in non-public schools are paid uh, competitive salaries. I hope you'll listen to the folks who follow after me or happy to answer questions anytime, Madam Chair. Thank you. Yes, we know Harrison is part of the morning crew <laughs> on social media. Uh, next, Matthew Ristow for two minutes, please. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Matthew Ristow and I am here to speak on behalf of House Bill 1301. I'm currently a teacher at Kennedy Krieger High School in Baltimore City and have been a teacher for almost 20 years. Additionally, I'm pursuing a PhD in Instructional Leadership for Changing Populations at Notre Dame University of Maryland. I've also taught for Baltimore County Public Schools in their general education and special education high school programs. I have taught AP level science classes as well as inclusion and self-contained special ed classes. Prior to returning to Kennedy Krieger High School after working for 12 years in Baltimore County Public Schools, I also served as a behavior interventionist for half a school year. So suffice it to say, I've seen and done many things in the educational arena. My purpose in coming today is to testify on the impact salary parity would have on the students and staff in our non-public schools. As a public school teacher, I was witness to the thousands upon thousands of students our public school systems are well equipped to serve. However, I was also witness to the few students for whom non-public schools are the only sustainable option. The students in our non-public schools were not failed by the public school system, but rather they simply require a different model, a model in which the effort of the educator, educators are less diffuse, but more concentrated. Interventions are less global, but more targeted. And educational programs are less communal and more individual. All of this is in response to IDEA and the glorious task of educating all children within our society. Such effort is commensurate with the effort put forth by public school teachers and mandated by the federal government. It then follows that our salaries be commensurate with not only our efforts, but with our public school colleagues who are also called at the same vocation. Calling our schools non-public is a misnomer. In fact, when working with our, public, uh, with our population, we are under greater scrutiny than we are than with public schools because we have to follow the IEP much more closely. So I'm here, it is for these reasons that I respectfully request your favorable report for House Bill 1301. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Catherine Beal for two minutes, please. Hi, my name is Catherine Bell and I work at the Ivy Mount School, which is a school for children with disabilities and I've worked there for six years. When I first started, I was in a group of four trainees and within a year and a half, I was the only one left. This job is hard. There is no denying that. However, one thing that makes this job even harder than it needs to be is the inequality of pay between the non-public and the public schools. We do everything that they do in the public schools and we do it while working to manage behaviors that were deemed unmanageable by the public schools. In addition, we complete nonstop training in order to make sure that we are giving our students the best possible education. And we work for 11 months out of the year in order to make sure that our students don't lose the gains that they fought so hard to get during the typical school year. The fact our salary is lower is causing more people to leave a field that is already struggling and we're leaving it in droves. Many of my colleagues work multiple jobs just to be able to continue to work this job, to be able to afford it. Also, due to the high price of living, many of us do live outside of the district in which we work. And with the rising cost of gas, the cost of inflation, I know some employees who are having to make a choice between what they can afford to eat and whether or not they can afford to fill their cars with gas to get to work. Over the course of the pandemic, the Maryland government has made it really clear it cares about its students. And one part of caring about the students is caring for the teachers that the students love that they've built relationships with. In order to best support our students, all the students, we also need to support the teachers. And I firmly believe that this begins with pay parity. Thank you for your time. Most, please. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Uh, my name is Dr. Chip Most. I'm Vice President and Chief of Schools and Residential Treatment Centers at Shepherd Pratt. 
I have dedicated the entirety of my 29 year career to special education here in Maryland. As the largest, largest provider of non-public special education in Maryland, Shepherd Pratt operates 12 special education schools in six counties, serves over 650 of the state's most vulnerable students and employs over 900 staff, including 125 teachers. Committee members, let me be clear about the students we, we serve at Shepherd Pratt and across all the non-public schools across Maryland. We educate the students that our public school counterparts are simply ill-equipped to manage. There is simply no reason that our teachers should be compensated 20 to 40% lower than their public school peers, 20 to 40%. We're losing teachers at an alarming rate to the public school system. At Shepherd Pratt, we lose an average of 28% a year over the last four years, 28% a year. These teachers consistently express that they would prefer to stay, but the opportunity to make thousands of dollars more is way too difficult to pass up. Due to the highly specialized nature of our work, it's imperative that teachers build strong, nurturing relationships with our students. This is accomplished through teacher tenure, not by teacher turnover. There's a long-standing belief in the non-public special education community that we are considered a training ground for the public schools, a training ground. Our teachers gain invaluable experience uh, in instructional and behavior management techniques only to be drawn away by the allure of a higher salary. As a leader in this field, I urge and implore you to come to the aid of our non-public teachers. Now is the time for action from this body. If we continue to lose teachers at this rate, the number, the number of students we can serve will plummet, placing additional stress on an increasingly fragile public school system. I appreciate your attention. Thank you. For two minutes. Who had you said? So you, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I didn't hear the name. Um, I'm sorry, my name is Sue McClendon and thank you, Madam Chair and the committee for the time today to speak to something that is very near to my heart. Um, I've served within the special education uh, non-public setting for over 22 years and currently serve as the MANSEF board president. MANSEF is an association of 70 non-public schools, just like how you've been hearing described. And we serve over, almost 4,000 students of the most vulnerable um, specialized needs in Maryland. Hiring for our schools has always been more of a challenge. Um, our work is a very special calling and it's not for everybody. Um, the salary disparity has always existed, but we're seeing it grow and grow. And most recently, the blueprint for Maryland's future addresses raising public school teacher salaries but what happens often is that our non-public school teachers are not considered. And in this case, they were not included in the Maryland blueprint for Maryland's, for Maryland's future. That means that gap is just going to grow. You've heard from some of the teachers in Mansef schools and I know their dedication comes through very clearly. I wanna talk about our students though, um, who are the greatest gift in our profession. They are so smart and talented. Um, they're all unique and special and worthy. They found their way to our setting because the public school has tried over and over again to find a plan and a set of services that will meet their needs. But in their case, they needed something more. The students who end up in our schools are the students that public school teachers thought about every day and drove home at night thinking about how they can work their very hardest and be at their most dedicated to meet their needs. Our non-public school teachers have chosen to serve whole classrooms of the students that occupy the most time and dedication in the non-public setting. We are it for our students. If we cannot have our students meet success, there is no other alternative location. And so because of that, we have to make it work and we have to pay our teachers in a way that shows that their work is just as valuable as their public school counterparts. I thank you for your support of House Bill 1301. Thank you. Caitlin Curtis for two minutes, please. Thank you. Um, my name is Caitlin Curtis, and thank you again for your time today to speak about this issue. I have worked in a non-public school setting for only four years, but I've 
the whole time been teaching special education students. I currently teach at the Baltimore Lab School in Baltimore, Maryland, which educates students with moderate to severe learning disabilities. I'm here today to address the salary disparity that many teachers like me face when serving within non-public institutions. As a master's graduate and a certified Maryland educator, I've worked really hard to get to the position I'm in today and teaching and supporting students like at my school um, at Baltimore Lab. To obtain a teaching position at a non-public institution, educators need to acquire additional educational certifications and attend specialized training, which is essential to effectively work with the unique population of students at schools um, like Baltimore Lab. And these certifications and pieces of training require non-public educators to go above and beyond the standards for public school educators. Often though, school budgets do not allow for financial assistance to non-public teachers for these additional certifications, programs, and trainings, nor do they provide opportunities for tuition reimbursement because of budget restrictions. Ultimately, the burden of costs falls on educators like me who pay out of pocket when we make significantly less money than our counterparts. I personally make $25,000 less than I would if I worked in the district of Baltimore City as a special educator with my experience and my qualifications. But I love my job and I love my students and I really wanna stay here. But as other um, speakers have said, the money is alluring because I have to survive. I'm in $50,000 of uh, student loan debt and there's no way that I can pay that off with the salary that I am earning. Um, just like many other teachers, they are in debt as well. And without that salary, we, we cannot continue to survive. <laughs> I'm asking for your support for HB 1303, which creates, sorry, 1301, which creates a system of parity that is desperately needed. Teachers like me deserve to feel appreciated and supported by the institutions they serve. Thank you. Thank you. Next, and hopefully I get this right, Brian or Brian Fraccia or Fraccia. Thank you very much. Uh, Brian Fraccia, you were very close. Okay. Um, I'm the education director with the Woodburn School. Um, I do want to just come back to the idea of non-public versus private schools. We are a non-public school. Non-public means not only are the students publicly funded, but we are not able to raise our tuition like a private school does. So we do not have the control of our budget to be able to raise our expenses, to keep our salaries commiserate with the public school salaries. So that is just an important point that I wanted to highlight um, because we do work with some of the most difficult students. Um, with the Warburn School, we work with students who have experienced significant trauma and abuse throughout their life. Um, and our goal is to help them to come back into the community. To do that puts quite a bit of pressure upon our educators. They serve both as educators, coaches, therapists, social emotional supports. And to provide that level of support, we are a 12 month program. So our teachers who work all year with some of the most difficult students are making significantly less than their Baltimore City teacher counterparts who are one mile down the road who only work 10 months a year. And this has an effect upon our ability to retain staff. Um, we started this year with four educators for an entire middle school and high school. I've lost three teachers in the past three months and they left because they could make more money down the road. Um, when that happens with a small non-public school, we lose the ability to teach physical education. We lose the ability to teach biology because we don't have that depth of pool that a public school system might have. So all we're asking for is just parity. Um, we just would like to be able to teach, pay our teachers the same amount as the public school teachers are paid so that we can retain those staff and so that we can train our educators and ensure that we have um, the classes and the staff that are needed for our most vulnerable youth. Thank you very much. Any questions for Delegate Corman or any of the witnesses who testified today? Okay, seeing no questions, thank you all for being here today. That concludes the testimony on House Bill 1301. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Next, House Bill 1349, Delegate Henson, and we have joining us members of the Appropriations Committee, colleagues Delegate Barnes, Delegates Forbes, and Delegate Greist are with us on this bill. 
And there are 11 witnesses after Delegate Henson who will have two minutes each. So Delegate Henson, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair and members of the Ways and Means Committee for the opportunity to present House Bill 1349, Education Support Professional Work Group and Bonus. I wish I could be as eloquent as my cross file on this, Senator Zucker, when he shared with the Senate Committee hearing the same bill, the story of his children's virtual education and how after many long hours on virtual education, it was the para support professionals that were there working with his children and spending a lot of time and care and attention to their academic needs. This bill will help us support those professionals who are not teachers, but support the work that's being done by teachers. During the pandemic, we had many unsung heroes, and this is one of those groups. When your job is to support the work of someone else, sometimes the ability for you to be supported yourself is not always present, but this bill gives us an opportunity to do just that. The bill will do two things. It will provide a bonus for our support professionals, and it would also establish a work group so that we can study the wages and classifications of those jobs. The wages of the employees in this profession have often been a barrier to being able to recruit and retain people in these jobs. More than half of support staff working full-time in 2020 to 2021 earn less than $35,000 a year here in the state of Maryland. So what we wanna do is study this, make sure that the wages are fair and that they're fairly compensating people who do this very important work. And in the meantime, while we commission and complete the study, provide a bonus for those very important support professionals. Thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, and members of the committee for your consideration. Thank you. Next for two minutes, County Executive Mark Elrich. So thank you very much, Madam Chair and uh, Vice Chair and the members of the committee. <clears throat> for the record, my name is Mark Elrich. I'm Montgomery County Executive. I'm pleased to be here today to speak in support of House Bill 1349. School support staff are essential to the school day for too long. Our school support staff have not gotten the respect and recognition they deserve or the compassion that makes sure that we can continue to recruit and retain outstanding people in these important positions. As we're seeing staggering staff shortages across the state, it's more important than ever that more steps are taken to make sure that we have, that our support staff feels valued, supported, and that they stay in the schools. As a former teacher, I can testify firsthand on the absolute critical nature of the support staff I had in my classroom. My job would have been immeasurably more difficult without their support, and they truly were able to do much of the same work that I was doing. So they really make a difference in education. Conditions exacerbated by the pandemic have led to crisis levels of vacancies among sports support staff. The pandemic raised the profile of support staff from their jobs as fellow educators, administrators, elected leaders, and parents depended on their expertise and commitment. Um, low pay has always been held back, um, has always held back the effective recruitment and retention of these valuable school employees. Many support staff work second jobs, struggle to provide for their families, buy homes, save for the future, and afford community or four-year college tuition for their children to learn a trade or plan a career. More than half of our support staff working full-time in 2021 earned less than 35,000. 53% were paid less than 35, 70% were paid less than 45. School support staff are the backbone of the safe, healthy, supportive learning working environment that we must have if our students are to succeed. I encourage you to support um, Senate Bill 831 and House Bill 1349, and thank you. Thank you. Next, John King for two minutes, please. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, Vice Chair Washington, committee members, and, and certainly thank you, Delegate Henson, for sponsoring this bill. As a teacher, principal, former United States Secretary of Education under President Obama and current Montgomery County Public Schools parent, I'm deeply concerned about the crisis level of vacancies we're seeing among our education support professionals and strongly encourage you to pass HB 1349. I owe my life to teachers and education support professionals. 
Both my parents passed away when I was very young. My mom when I was eight, my dad when I was 12. Like many young people who have experienced trauma, I struggled in high school. I actually got kicked out of high school. The thing that saved me was public schools and public school educators, including public school education support professionals. I know our schools literally would not function without the dedicated education support professionals that keep them running. ESPs are vital to our children's future and they deserve a living wage at minimum. There are almost 42,000 education support professionals in Maryland, but as you've heard, over half of them make less than $35,000 a year. From providing vital access to meals to helping students get online, the pandemic proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that education support professionals are irreplaceable members of our public education system. Their work is vital, is worth much more than near poverty wages, and we have a moral obligation to pay education support professionals what they deserve if we want to provide all of our children in Maryland with the world-class public education they deserve. For these reasons, I urge a favorable report on HB 1349. Thank you. Next for two minutes, Sally Murick, please. Good afternoon, my name is Sally Murick and I'm a paraeducator with Montgomery County Public Schools where I've worked to support staff and in the instruction of students for 31 years. I'm here to share my support for HB 1349. Much has been shared with you in previous testimonies of how the heroes of the school system stepped up during the pandemic to ensure instruction continued for our students, our children, and why they are deserving of a bonus and a wage study. I wish to expand on the courage, flexibility, and stamina of the parents they were called upon to pivot instantly into a digital instructional world. Alongside of teachers, they took multiple and daily just-in-time trainings to learn all the virtual platforms and tools that would be available and needed to deliver virtual instruction, which was effective and engaging. On top of the hours of technological trainings, they had to establish their home classrooms and set up technology for virtual delivery while spending hours collaborating with their peers and teachers. Many also had to supervise their own children through their digital learning classes and being at home rather than in school or childcare and to handle the trauma and anxiety of the pandemic for themselves and their families. Montgomery County Public Schools has approximately 2,700 parents. 60% have a four-year degree, another 20% have master's degree, and we have a number that hold PhDs. Our parents have chosen this as their career, not because it is all they can do. They love supporting the academics and growth of our students. During COVID, many, many parents have stepped up and to be teachers covering classes for a day, a week, and even as long-term subs because of high absenteeism and unfulfilled teacher positions. Parents love working in schools and supporting the academic and well-being development of our students, but they have financial needs and families too. Low wages are affecting our recruitment and retention of these valuable and educated employees. Many must work second jobs and struggle to provide for their families, buy homes, and provide for their futures. We have heard terrible stories of parents being homeless and living out of their cars, even though they are fully employed by our schools. They are essential, but are not paid as if they are. Parents are an educational support professionals are the backbone of our schools. They deserve a fair wage and recognition for the value they bring. I ask for your favorable support. Thank you. Thank you. Pia Morrison for two minutes, please. Dear Chairwoman Atterbury, Vice Chair Washington, and members of the House Ways and Means Committee, it great, it's great to be with you today. My name is Pia Morrison, President of SCIU Local 500. SCIU Local 500 represents approximately 20,000 working people in Montgomery County and across our region. Our membership includes the thousands of support staff, professionals at MCPS, part-time faculty at Montgomery College, child care providers, and more. I am proud to stand alongside Delegate Hans Hansen, MSEA, and other organizations in support of HB 1349. SCIU Local 500 represents over 9,000 support staff at MCPS, which is the largest school district in Maryland. We represent Paris, bus operators, office staff, building service worker, food service workers, and many more. On behalf of the thousands of support staff members, we wanna thank Delegate Henson for being a champion of K through 12 education and our members. House Bill 1349 not only includes a modest bonus to acknowledge the sacrifice the thousands of support staff made throughout Maryland during the COVID-19 pandemic, but also forms a work group to study wages for support staff across our state and to make recommendations on how to attract and retain staff. 
Support staff are essential to the school day, but for far too long, they've not gotten the respect or the recognition they so richly deserve. They're the backbone of the safe, healthy, and supportive learning and working environments that have to exist if educators and students are to succeed. For their extraordinary commitment, they deserve a fair wage and recognition for the value they bring to education. During the pandemic, food and nutrition staff continued preparing and distributing thousands of meals for students each day. Security staff helped at schools with the distribution of meals and bus drivers delivered meals to those schools and helped to distribute to families. Our instructional technology staff work to support the delivery, repair, and operations of thousands of technology devices and internet hotspots for students and teachers. Building service workers perform additional sanitizing procedures in buildings. Maintenance workers work diligently to improve air quality and change filters and set up air purifiers. Warehouse workers received and sorted masks and other COVID-19 equipment. Secretaries pivoted their duties, and it was paraeducators that dove into learning all the new instructions technology so they could continue to support students and teachers with online learnings. It was the effort of these individuals that they did that while continuing Morrison, can you wrap up your testimony, please? Sure. While they continue to support student and families, we call on the General Assembly to pass HB 1349 and urge a favorable committee report. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Thank you. Next, Cynthia Popper, please, for two minutes. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, delegates. This afternoon, I'm going to tell you a story. In 2007, a longtime substitute teacher joined Harford County Public Schools. She had a BA from Goucher College. Her salary was family fund money. Then the crash of 2010-11 hit. Her family, like many others, went from a two-income family to a one-income family. They became victims of the mortgage fiasco and lost their home. They spent two months living in a one-room motel room. As their family income was, the, was only the HCPS salary of under $13,500, their options were limited. They finally found a home, a rental they could barely afford, but they were surviving. In May of 2013, her husband was diagnosed with stage four cancer. He died three months later. The ESP was now living on an HCPS salary of under $14,500 a year. She did what she could, Life insurance money was spent on the basics. There was not a penny to spend elsewhere. For two and a half years, she managed as best she could, but when the money was gone, her options became smaller and smaller. Earning under $15,000 a year was severely limiting. In early 2016, out of options, she relinquished her home as she could no longer afford it. For the second time in five years, she was homeless. Blessed by the kindness of her friends, for three months she stayed where she could until she could find another solution. In July of 2016, with the help of her parents, she secured a home, but life is still not without its challenges. She drives a 17-year-old vehicle, her home needs repairs that she cannot afford, and frugality is still a necessity. She is currently 65 years old, has worked for Harford County Public Schools for 15 years, and earns under $32,000 a year. This or similar story could be told by any of our systemically underpaid ESBs. It is not fiction. It is being told to make a point. It's a true story, and the person that lived that story is me. The ESPs of Maryland deserve a living wage. Please vote yes on House Bill 1349. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Popper. Sandra Davis, please, for two minutes. Madam Chair, we're just verifying. Um, she's in the waiting room, but um, she's just down as I speak, so we're just verifying it's her. Okay, we'll move to Cheryl um, Bose, please, for two minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Atterbury, Vice Chair Washington, members of the committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak before you today. And I wanna say thank you to Cindy Popper for telling her story. Um, it's an emotional one and we thank her. My name is Cheryl Bost. I'm a fourth and fifth grade teacher from Morris Estates Elementary School in Baltimore County, currently proudly serving as the president for the Maryland State Education Association. MSEA 76,000 educators from across the state stand before you to urge your support for Senate Bill 831, I'm sorry, <laughs> for House Bill 1349 and Senate Bill 831, which will provide for a pay increase for education support professionals and create a work group needed to study the wages 
as we move into the future. Education support professionals, commonly referred to as ESPs, are essential to everyday function of the education in our state. I know that firsthand as a teacher. Our education support professionals are bus drivers, paraeducators, custodians, clericals, maintenance workers, food service employees, tech support, nursing assistants, and so many more job categories. As Delegate Henson said, these are unsung heroes and sheroes in our schools. We depend on their expertise and commitment to students and families for small group virtual learning, the distribution of maintenance and devices, record keeping and tracking of every changing policy, endless upkeep of our school system, safety protocols and distribution of breakfast and lunch. In fact, on March 13th, when schools closed, our cafeteria workers and custodians and many bus drivers went into work on March 15th to feed millions of our students and families. For far too long, our support professionals have not gotten the respect and recognition they deserve, and they need this compensation. Senate Bill, 8, uh, House, Senate Bill 831 and House Bill 1349 will utilize the current budget surplus to give support staff a $500 bonus in FY23 and FY24 and create a work group to investigate this further. We also support the maker's amendments to make sure it's a more inclusive definition within the bill. We urge your favorable support for this and stand with our colleagues. I'm excited that you get to hear from ESPs today that have taken off work to come testify before you. Thank you. Thank you. Sandra Davis, please, for two minutes. Good afternoon, Chairman Atterbury and members of the Ways and Means Committee. I am Sandra Davis. I'm an employee of Baltimore City Public School System. I am the chairperson of the Baltimore Teachers Union, paraprofessional and school-related personnel chapter, and I'm a vice president of AFT Maryland. On behalf of the AFT Maryland, I ask for a favorable report to House Bill 1349, the bill that would form a work group to study the wages and compensation packages to education support personnel who are so vital to the education of Maryland students. I believe you have my written testimony, so I want to highlight a few points and then can answer any questions. Members of the committee, it is important that this committee recognize and appreciate the work I, along with my fellow paraeducators and support personnel do in order to ensure the students of Maryland schools have the best educational outcomes. On a typical day, a public school student in Maryland can interact with as many as six paraeducation educators and education support personnel before they foot in the classroom. We do so much of the work that is needed, yet not recognized or completely appreciated. In order to be sure that a student is ready to learn that day, everything from helping the student get on the bus, making sure the classroom is ready and prepared to receive the students, helping individual students with their social and emotional needs. Many of us also provide assistance to our students with specific medical needs to ensure the best possible education experience for them. I myself have been a paraeducator working in Baltimore City Public School System for 32 years and have worked at seven different schools. So I'm quite familiar with the numerous jobs and hats that paraeducators and sport personnel wear on any given school day. If paraeducators and support personnel aren't there to make sure this work gets done, educating our school students in Maryland would be impossible. If enacted, Davis, this bill would Ms. be a step Davis. in the right direction Ms. towards Davis, the I'm just have to ask you to compensation for paraeducators and support personnel and recognizing the value of the work numerous different support personnel are engaged in. Again, yes. Thank you, Ms. Davis. I'm going to have to ask you to wrap up your testimony. I'm just finished my last sentence. And again, okay, AFT ahead. Maryland called for a favorable report for House Bill 1349. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Inez Tate Franklin for two minutes. I'm done. Thank you. 
Greetings, Chair Atterbury and honorable members of the Ways and Means Committee. My name is Inez Tate Franklin, and I am an education support professional in the Baltimore County Public School System. Today, I am providing testimony in support of House Bill 1349, a bill that will provide a bonus to ESPs and work to find a long-term solution to low wages and issues of retention. I'm a paraeducator at Winfield Elementary School in Baltimore County. As a board member of Education Support Professionals of Baltimore County, I am compelled to do what is in the best interest of students and the employees I represent within the ESPBC bargaining unit. Education Support Professionals provide and perform critical functions in our schools every day. However, many ESPs still do not make a living wage. I am deeply concerned about how high inflation and low salaries impact ESPBC members. Many members are working secondary jobs just to make ends meet. To attract and retain highly qualified education support professionals throughout the state of Maryland, we need to work to find a solution to increase wages. I am hopeful that if House Bill 1349 is passed, it will help to provide insight and solutions that can help to retain and grow our professions. I kindly urge the committee for a favorable vote on House Bill 1349. Thank you. Thank you. Aruna Miller for two minutes, please. Today on Harriet Tubman Day, our nation recognizes the heroic acts of a Marylander who touched the future and gave the greatest gift of all, freedom for so many. Good afternoon, Madam Chair Atterbury, Vice Chair Washington, and the Ways and Means Committee, as well as Delegate Henson for sponsoring House Bill 1349. I'm Aruna Miller. I wanna thank each and every one of you as legislators for the many ways you touch the future by creating policies that support the well-being and the economic security of our public employees and Marylanders. Similarly, education support professionals touch the future by preparing our children for the future. Through their roles as paraeducators, custodians, bus drivers, food service workers, and other roles, they play a vital role in meeting the essential needs of the whole student. Look, I know that policy changes are not single issues, but are complex and dynamic. That's why House Bill 1349 is important, because it would establish a work group to seek equitable solutions for compensation and provide a bonus. Let the legacy of Harriet Tubman be a reminder to all of us that there is still much work that lies ahead of us. Work of the future, the work of equity. Thank you, Sally Murick, Cindy Popper, Sandra Davis, Ines Tate Franklin, and the many other ESPs for your service. I urge your favorable report on House Bill 1349. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. And there are a couple of questions. Delegate Ebersol. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And I'm, I may be placing some people on the spot here, but as an educator myself for many years, I know that one of the most difficult things that we that I had to deal with is that the turnover of ESPs, um, a, a support personnel would show up to help us do any one of a number of things, including instruction, but not limited to that. And then in a year, they'd be gone or two years, they'd be gone and we'd have a new person to explain what it was we needed. And so does anybody have a sense, is there any way to uh, quantify the turnover rate of ESPs in various uh, categories? Probably more than you want to give here, but if I, if I could just give a sense of how quick, how long uh, an ESP tends to work in a job before they move on to something else. I'll leave it to anybody, but if you don't have it, I just wanna make the point that it happens a lot. Karen. Chairwoman Atterbury, uh, I don't have that exact statistic. I know that uh, in one of our districts, we had 600 vacancies mid-year in our ESP ranks. And so I, I can tell you it often depends on the, the position where we see turnover. And you saw throughout the state, the missing bus drivers that we had and students couldn't get to school, which is a major equity issue as well. 
Thanks. Yeah. yeah and may I, I just add really quickly, Delegate Yes, please Ebersole, do. Yeah, thanks. That um, according to Economic Policy Institute, when they're looking at the great resignation and the industries that people are leaving, education is K through 12 education is number two on that list. And, and most acutely, why would people stay in an ESP job if they make $23,000 a year? So thank you very much. Delegate Patterson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And Thank you very much, uh, Delegate Henson, for this very timely and needed legislation. Um, full disclosure, I was on a, a served as a board member for 12 years in Charles County. And right now I'm really concerned about our, not only uh, statewide, but also locally, the issues that some of our, para, you call them paraeducators, uh, specifically our bus drivers uh, are facing as it relates to hours and wages, et cetera. So in your study, will consideration be given to those bus drivers who are on the contractors with your study versus those who are, who are with the school boards? I hope it's not confusing. Our bus drivers, we have about 47 who work for separate contractors. Uh, and so we're looking uh, at ways in which they will be given the opportunity to make decent wages as well as assured guaranteed hours of employment. Thank you for the question, Delegate Patterson, and thank you for your support to para educators and to those in the education field. The study is looking to look at all professionals, regardless of the classification there. So our goal would be to see what wages are being paid, what wages are competitive, and what wages are needed in the field to be able to have a livable, sustainable position. Thank you very much for that. Thank you again for this legislation. Are there any other questions for the bill sponsor or any of the witnesses? Okay, seeing... Okay, I think I missed someone. John Willems for two minutes. So Madam Chair, members of the committee, John Willems representing the Maryland Association of Boards of Education. Uh, me too, for all the reasons that you've heard in strong support of this legislation. Um, I will uh, just share a little story about my son when he was an elementary school student, Teacher Appreciation Day. We stopped at Giant to buy flowers uh, and he wanted three uh, bouquets of flowers for the principal and his teacher. And I said, who was the third for? And he said, well, that's easy, Ms. So-and-so, uh, the custodian. And I said, really? And he said, yes, yeah, she's definitely one of the hardest working people in the school, dad, and she needs to be recognized. We got to school. She was called to the office to get her flowers. She teared up. This bill is about a lot more than flowers. This bill is about pay equity and the adequacy of compensation for some of the hardest working uh, folks who support teaching and learning in our school systems every day and urge a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you, and Mr. Willems, I apologize about that. Um, are there any questions? Anyone have any questions for Mr. Willems? Okay, seeing none, thank you, Delegate Henson and everyone that came today to testify. That concludes the testimony on House Bill 1349. Moving on to our last bill of the day, House Bill 1255, Delegate Ebersol, and there are a good amount of folks uh, who will have two minutes to testify, um, but whenever you're ready, you may begin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Eric Ebersol here to talk to you about House Bill 1255 and a very serious issue that it is addressing. And I really need to give credit to a couple of legislators who've helped work on this issue in the past, Delegate Wilkins, who's present, and Delegate Lukey, who's present, have both spent some time working on this because generally we're in agreement that the business of restraining and secluding students is one that needs to be examined very carefully and perhaps in the future done away with completely. Um, restraining a student is uh, when you hold them in down or, or pin them in a way or in any sort of restraint like that, but more, uh, and, and this bill deals with that, it actually it eliminates it except in the most serious of situations. But we spent a lot more time focusing in this bill on the issue of seclusion. Seclusion is essentially putting a child in a prison cell. It's putting them in a room that is locked, that they cannot get out of. 
even if they choose to. And there are a number of uh, issues in Comar that talk about the way this has to be done so that it's done safely. But safely, I would put in quotes. By safely, we mean that there's someone watching, someone who can release the student if there's a fire, uh, who keeps an eye on them. Um, but in fact, uh, the business of seclusion probably isn't very safe at all, both mentally and physically for a student. And to seclude a student, to, to fall into a situation where you seclude a student is, is, uh, has to be a significant situation. And I commend the members of the uh, Early Childhood Subcommittee who came out with me and visited several schools during the interim to look at seclusion, where seclusion is done and how it's done to get a sense of what we should put into this bill when we go forward. And so we've arrived at this. Seclusion, secluding a student in a locked room should really not be done in a public school setting. There are other ways to deal with students like that. And uh, seclusion is not the answer. So this bill calls for public institutions to not seclude students during the school day. Seclusion, and we heard a great deal of testimony on House Bill 1301 uh, about the facilities that deal with very difficult students. They're called non-public schools. Non-public schools say there are times when a student needs to be secluded to, um, to let them cool down or to, for the safety of other students or for their own safety. Um, there are varying levels of thought on that. You're going to hear some folks come on and say that even that's not a, a legitimate time to do it. But in this bill, we uh, limit that to when there is a list of five professionals, any one of these five professionals who is in the building, says that it's indicated, and then is there as part of the observation while it's happening. This bill also has a great deal of reporting about how much seclusion is done. You're all familiar with the story about a particular county in the state that at public schools, secluded students uh, ad nauseum, I would say. That would be eliminated by this bill because that was mostly done in a public school setting, not a non-public setting in, in those situations. We'll also have a red flag for students in the reporting that are uh, secluded more, if a single student secluded more than 10 times in a school year, we have a number of other uh, kind of limitations on it. Um, I'll be happy to drill down on some of those, but in the end, we should see no seclusion in public facilities. We should see it only in the non-public facilities when they have uh, proper professionals on board to recommend it and to supervise it. Um, beyond that, uh, I'll leave this to the, to the rest of the people who feel very strongly about this as well. And thank you, Madam Chair, for these few minutes to talk about it. Thank you. First up, Tracy Monsieur for two minutes, please. Hello, hi, um, my name is Tracy Mazur. And I've spoken to this, um, I've testified before this committee before. Uh, I'm the parent of a six-year-old kindergartner in a Maryland public elementary school. I went into this school year prepared with a comprehensive IEP, and I was and continue to be a very proactive and involved parent. Despite this, my little one was subjected to multiple non-sanctioned traumatic restraints under the guise of a transport or physical escort. I persisted to see footage, which was only available from hallway cameras. The footage proved an aggressive restraint that is not even taught by the county school system it was being used on my young child. They would grab my child backwards while he, while they walked forwards with my six-year-old's arms supporting the weight of their entire body. The school staff would then either lift my child so their feet were in the air or drag my child with feet limp through the halls of their elementary school. These restraints were done by multiple staff, including administration and special educators, often multiple times a day. Sorry, if I get upset. <laughs> I was not given proper proper, proper note, documentation for MSD in accordance with Comar. Instead, it was, I was told it was not happening. My six-year-old also spent significant time in a quiet room, which had many names in the four months my child was at the school. Other names included de-escalation room, timeout room, safe room, room one, and alternative learning environment. My child was also placed in a classroom with only adults for large portions of the day, isolated from all peers. This was also referred to as an alternative learning environment. My kindergartner was transported, which was restrained, multiple times within that room to a de-escalation space made of gym mats. My child was always blocked from leaving the quiet room, alternative learning environment, and the gym mat enclosure. I've, ne I've said before, I've never given permission for restraint or seclusion use, and it was not in my child's IEP. When asked if my small child was being restrained or secluded, I was repeatedly told no. My six-year-old has been severely traumatized after only four months of kindergarten in our districted, districted Maryland public elementary school. Um, for the sake of all vulnerable children, I ask that you strongly support House Bill 1255. Thank you. 
Leslie Margolis for two minutes, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Leslie Side Margolis, and I'm a managing attorney at Disability Rights Maryland. Our written testimony and the written testimony of the Education Advocacy Coalition explain in more detail why we support this bill. 20 years ago, I testified before this committee in support of the first legislation to govern restraint and seclusion in schools. As part of the work group that was created by the bill to write regulations with the Maryland State Department of Education, I remember arguing um, that seclusion has no place in schools. Um, my position did not prevail. I understand this is um, incremental work. And over the years, we have banned prone restraint. We've imposed an imminent serious physical harm standard on the use of restraint and seclusion. And we have required the collection of data with annual reports to the General Assembly. Um, but there's a need for more. It's really gratifying um, and really validating that this year for the very first time, we have the superintendent of the Maryland State Department of Education here to testify in support of accountability and of protecting students from these outdated, traumatic and dangerous methods of behavior control. The data that has been um, collected since 2017 shows that, that restraint and seclusion continue to be used at high rates in many jurisdictions and are used disproportionately with children with disabilities, children of color and very young children. In 2017, many of you watched the video of my young child being dragged down the school hallway on his knees and pushed into a seclusion room where he sustained an unexplained injury and was um, huddled in a puddle of blood when the door was opened. Unfortunately, many students continue to be injured and traumatized during restraint and seclusion, which makes this legislation particularly necessary. Several local school systems and non-public schools already ban seclusion. And I know you know that um, because of the, the Department of Justice's investigation, um, Frederick County does as well. But justice should not have to come district by district um, throughout the state. This, is a, this legislation is a way of ensuring that Maryland can be at the forefront of uh, protecting children and making sure that school is a safe and nurturing place for all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Rachel London for two minutes, please. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm Rachel London, the Executive Director of the Maryland Developmental Disabilities Council. We're a statewide public policy organization that creates change to make it possible for people with developmental disabilities to live the lives they want with the support they need. You've heard what's happened, all of the history, and I know that you know that. You know why it's necessary, and you've heard that it is actually possible. So I wanna just reiterate a few things. First, there are six local school systems that have already banned the use of seclusion in their schools. And there's a seventh, Howard County's uh, board voted to ban it in the next school year. Second, you have heard that we have, have a lot of data. Um, in the 2019-2020 school year, when schools closed halfway through, the number of restraint incidents increased in four local school systems and the number of seclusion incidents increased in six local school systems. Again, this is when schools were closed um, halfway through the year. The third thing is MSD collects the data. You, we passed the bill in 2017, but it does no analysis. It doesn't identify trends or target districts with high numbers. So in addition to the data that's already collected, this bill requires reporting of individual students by schools to the local school system and MSD if a student is restrained or secluded in a non-public school more than 10 times a year. Finally, you're going to hear a lot about uh, that a licensed behavior analyst should be added to the list of healthcare practitioners who may use seclusion against a student in a non-public special education school. I offer two things. This bill is aimed at making schools do business differently. Licensed behavior analysts are one of the reasons rates are so high. Um, and two, since you've heard similar bills throughout the years, proponents have worked very closely with the non-public schools to include more healthcare practitioners, including licensed professional counselors was added this year. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Andy Culp for two minutes, please. Yes, hi, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. 
For the record, my name is Andy Culp, and I'm here in support of House Bill 1255 in, um, on behalf of the ARC Maryland, I'm sorry. The ARC is dedicated to protecting and advancing the rights of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And you have my written testimony, um, so I won't duplicate that of the testimony already provided by others, including the sponsor, but I just say me too to that. I wanna touch on a couple of critical data points for your consideration. The state data that was referred to from the 2019-2020 school year, which by the way was an un, in, is it was an interrupted school year. It's not, it doesn't even represent a full year of school because um, the kids were out of the physical structure after March that year. Um, but it showed that restraint was used over 12,000 times and close to 60% of students involved were students with disabilities. Seclusion was used over 6,000 6, times in seclusion and 57% of those incidents involve students with disabilities. Um, another final point I wanna make is that with this removal of seclusion and the curtailing of restraint in this bill, um, the bill requires support for teachers so that they have the tools they need to successfully support and educate students with evidence-based positive behavioral interventions and trauma-informed care. And that's so very important we can't create an environment where students with behavioral challenges are pushed out of their neighborhood schools when educators and administrators feel they can't effectively manage their behaviors. And so they must um, have and employ supportive alternatives to restraint and seclusion to ensure kids with disabilities can receive um, positive interventions, including trauma-informed care, and they can remain in their neighborhood schools. Thank you. Thank you. The next group of individuals are favorable with amendment. First, State Superintendent Chaudhry, please. State Superintendent Chaudhry. I'm here. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Atterbury, Vice Chair Washington, and members of the committee. I am Mohammed Chaudhry, State Superintendent of Schools, here to express uh, the Maryland State Department of Education support and requested amendments to House Bill 1255. I believe in grounding these conversations in research, and research consistently shows there is no evidence that using restraint or seclusion is effective. The department submitted written testimony with more detail, but I came to make three points here in person. First, there's no place in Maryland schools for the use of seclusion, whether those are public or non-public schools. Locking a student in a room by himself, preventing him from leaving is simply unacceptable. Regardless of whether that room is in a public or non-public school, the bill should ban seclusion entirely. Second, all but most limited forms of restraint in the most extreme and rare situations should also be banned. The bill should also include the types of restraint that cannot be used in any case. Third, schools a third, schools restraining or secluding students unlawfully or frequently must be held accountable. In these cases, the bill should require a systemic evidence-based corrective action plan. Simply giving more professional development is not enough. I do want to thank the sponsors of this bill for their dedication and work. I know we are working towards similar goals and the bill does take an important initial step. As you continue to debate and refine, I suggest you refer to the Keeping All Students Safe Act, a federal proposal that includes strong definitions of relevant terms and protections for students, including by banning seclusion. Our most vulnerable students need us to not fall back on the convenience of later. We'll do more next year is a hollow promise to the families of students who have been deeply impacted. If a phased approach over the course of two or three years is necessary or required, we can work on an implementation timeline. For example, in Illinois, the General Assembly just passed a law that requires plans to eliminate restraint and seclusion over a three-year period. We can do something similar in terms of a timeline in this bill, but we should make a decision now this year and make clear that these ineffective and often abusive practices are no longer going to be allowed in Maryland by a date certain. If we can strengthen and pass this bill, Maryland has an opportunity to be a true leader, the leader, frankly. Then thank you for the opportunity to testify today and please reach out to MSDE if we can be of help as you continue this work. Thank you. Thank you. Marjorie Clark for two minutes, please. Hi, um, good afternoon. My name is Marjorie Clark. I am the Autism Program Director at the Ivy Mount School in Montgomery County. Um, and I've proudly served some of Maryland's most exceptional learners for over 20 years now. Um, the exceptionality I refer to, you may have heard described by my colleague and other non-publics um, in their testimony in House Bill 1301 earlier. 
Um, so I'm here to share my strong support um, for House Bill 1255. Um, I'm certainly supportive of a bill that seeks to improve the oversight and use of restraint and seclusion, which should only be uh, really emergency practices, um, not treatment, um, and seeks to protect the safety and well-being of my students. I would like to request an amendment to include a licensed behavior analyst, or um, I may refer to as an LBA, as one of the qualifying healthcare practitioners defined in this bill, and that was described by um, Delegate Ebersol earlier. Um, this was introduced. Behavior analysts practicing in Maryland have to be licensed by the Maryland State Board of Professional Counselors and Therapists. The LBAs at Ivy Mount are really critical to the success um, of the students that are placed with us. They're responsible for conducting functional behavior assessment to, um, to develop behavior plans. Um, simply put, they spend substantial time reviewing historical data, um, interviewing students, teachers, caregivers, um, observing um, and building really trusting and, really, and supportive relationships with each of their students. Um, beyond that assessment period, the LBA spends their day observing and interacting regularly with their students and reviewing student data to ensure the success of their plans. Um, so the inclusion of an LBA as a healthcare practitioner is in line with the spirit of this bill, which um, seems to be, I believe, to be to improve the health and safety of our most vulnerable population of students. I appreciate your consideration um, of this amendment. Kathy Flannery for two minutes, please. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Kathy Flannery, Regional Director of Shepherd Pratt Schools. I have been with Shepherd Pratt Schools for 21 years. We provide non-public special education services in 12 schools in six counties across the state of Maryland. We serve 650 students annually. Today, I am testifying on behalf of Shepherd Pratt that we strongly support House Bill 1255 with an amendment. Shepherd Pratt schools serve a vulnerable population of students with complex behavior, learning, and mental health needs. When students are referred to us, it is because their needs cannot be met in their home public school or other less restrictive learning environment. Once in our care, it is our responsibility to replace and reshape behaviors that students have engaged in for years. Students may engage in self-injurious behavior, aggression toward others, and or property destruction. They may engage in these behaviors at frequencies that exceed 100 incidents per day, and in some cases, 100 incidents per hour at high levels of intensity. On some occasions, use of more restrictive techniques such as restraint or seclusion as a last resort may be required to maintain safety for a student and the school environment. A group of practitioners who play a key role in determining effective behavior interventions for students are licensed behavior analysts. LBAs are experts in the field of applied behavior analysis and uniquely qualified to directly observe, assess, and determine effective individualized interventions for students. Their reliance on using systematic approaches and making data-driven decisions leads to socially significant improvement in behavior. As members of a student's IEP team, LBAs spend most of the time in the classroom observing students when they are engaging in unsafe or dangerous behaviors. When use of a more restrictive behavior intervention is necessary to mitigate risk and prevent harm to all, our LBAs and other professionals are present to observe, monitor, and provide feedback regarding this situation. We respectfully request that licensed behavior analysts be added to the list of healthcare practitioners who qualify as professionals that can observe seclusion and or determine if the use of seclusion is contraindicated for a student in a non-public school. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. John Willems for two minutes, please. Madam Chair, members of the committee, John Wollums, representing the Maryland Association of Boards of Education, uh, here today to testify in support of House Bill 1255. Mabe's written testimony uh, indicates, I think, two things primarily. One is that the bill proposes to make a practice illegal in the public school setting, but not in the non-public uh, special education school setting, which raises concerns about the reassignment of students uh, who have uh, certain behavioral responses and strategies included uh, in their IEPs. Uh, and behavioral intervention plans uh, and the time uh, that may be required to transition uh, under any new uh, law uh, such as being proposed in 1255. Uh, the testimony also indicates that the State Department of Education under Superintendent Chaudhry's leadership has expressed a pointed interest in completely revisiting and revamping this issue. You've already heard from the superintendent. Um, I followed his testimony on the Senate side just days ago have seen uh, the department's testimony and proposed amendments and believe that Mabe's request for amendments is very much aligned uh, with Superintendent Chaudhry's and the department's desire uh, to develop a plan to transition uh, away from some of these practices uh, and to bolster reporting and enforcement 
of instances when uh, they are in fact employed. And so again, request a favorable report on House Bill 1255 uh, with amendments that are largely uh, geared toward ensuring a smooth transition away from practices uh, for which people have been trained, facilities have been designed, uh, and to uh, cite Ms. Margolis' reference to the incremental changes we've made, this will be more than incremental. This will be a sea change in practices, and we just need to uh, recognize that as we move forward. Thank you. Aaron Parsons, please. Good afternoon, Madam Chairwoman and committee members. I'm Dr. Aaron Parsons, Vice President for School Programs at Kennedy Krieger Institute. On behalf of Kennedy Krieger School Programs and MANSEF, I'm here to support House Bill 1255 with the request for an amendment. We serve approximately 500 students in our four school programs. These students are referred to us by local education agencies. For many of our students and families, we are the quote unquote last resort prior to a residential placement because of the complexity of the student's instructional, behavioral, and emotional needs. Physical restraint and seclusion in our schools are not designed or intended to teach or change behavior. They are implemented to stop aggressive or self-injurious behavior that presents imminent harm to a person. A portion of our students may engage in these behaviors repeatedly despite robust positive behavioral supports and highly individualized plans created by multidisciplinary teams. <clears throat> Please note that even in our setting, roughly 80 to 85% of the students we serve have never required either intervention after their enrollment with us. House Bill 1255 provides additional safeguards for Maryland students. Rigorous clinical involvement regarding the use of seclusion in a school can prevent abusive practices. Enhanced data reporting, mandatory review, and the data-driven action required will ensure that Maryland schools engage in meaning meaningful policy revision, creating better outcomes for students. The need for robust clinical involvement and meaningful data review also drives our request for an amendment to include licensed behavior analysts to the list of healthcare professionals authorized to provide oversight to the use of seclusion in our non-public schools. Thank you for your consideration of our request for this amendment. Thank you. Next, Christine Accardo, please, for two minutes. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of this committee. I'm Dr. Christina Cardo, the Director of Clinical Programs at the Schaefer Center and a licensed psychologist, BCBAD, and an LBA. The Schaefer Center is a school that welcomes students with the most intense levels of problem behavior to our program, and we are proud to work with these wonderful students and families. I'm here to express support for this bill with an amendment. I support the members addressing this critical issue, and I agree that the use of restraint and seclusion must be carefully monitored and only done when needed for safety of the students and others around them. However, the proposed language puts the safety of students at risk by excluding the healthcare pra practitioners with the most significant experience, oversight, and analytic skills to oversee seclusion by omitting licensed behavior analysts. LBAs are required to hold a BCBA credential, which requires being trained on how to work with students who engage in dangerous behaviors. We focus on determining the function of the behavior or the why the students engage in dangerous behaviors. We're required to do analysis, teach functional alternatives, and take specific data on interventions that we put in place. In addition, we're required to have strict adherence to ethics codes designed for working with students who would need interventions such as seclusion. At the Schaefer Center, the safety of our students is our number one priority, and because of this mission, the Schaefer Center currently has eight BCBAs for 32 students. These are the best professionals to assist in making safe and meaningful progress for these students whom other students often reject or cannot manage. We're often able to avoid the need for such things as restraint or seclusion because of the high level of expertise which we have at our school. As a psychologist and a BCBA, all of my knowledge and expertise in this area was gained through my BCBA training and continuing education requirements. Very few psychologists have this expertise or training, and those of us who do are part of the behavior analytic community. Please amend this bill to include LBAs as one of the healthcare professionals authorized to provide oversight to the use of seclusion in a non-public school. Thank you so much for considering this amendment. Thank you. Committee, are there any questions? 
Okay, seeing no questions, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 1255. Thank you all for being here today. And that concludes the testimony, or I'm sorry, that concludes the bill hearings for the Ways and Means uh, Committee today. Um, folks, let's just wait one second to go off of